Thank you for the introduction and thank you for uh, having me here. This is a scene from a movie called The Matrix. And it's a, how many people here have seen the movie The Matrix? No. no. Okay. You know, like The Lord of the Rings we were talking earlier, this is a movie that came out in 1999 as science fiction and, and you have to accept that. But there are a whole lot of themes that were coming into there. And one of them is, here it has, you have a guy telling this computer technology kid that if he takes the red pill, he could take the red pill or the blue pill. If he takes the blue pill, he'll fall asleep and go back to his world. And he'll never have any memory of it. But if he takes the red pill, he will see what the world looks like and he will never, ever not see it any other way. Well, he takes the red pill and then he realizes once he takes the red pill, pill that the world has been, has been enslaved. And in this movie, the science fiction movie, it's through a, a high technology and artificial intelligence. But when you go through the movie, you, when you go through the movie, you find that it is itself kind of a harbinger of what's happened. But he takes the blue pill. So what would happen is I would be briefing in the Pentagon or at the agencies and, and the special operations group, like the SEALs or the Delta Force people. And they, I would give them the brief and maybe about a month or two later, people would start being fired. You know, they would, they would start to see what was going on. And, and I, I'll stay vague about that. But, uh, and they called my briefings the Red Pill Brief. And they were, they were very famous in Washington, D.C. So, so much so famous that the Muslim Brotherhood made it their point to get me pushed out. And I was pushed out. So um, uh, what happened is a woman, uh, Christine Brim, came up to me. She worked for the Center for Security Policy. She said, Steve, these briefings are the only thing that have gotten people to look the other way and see what's happening. And one day someone's going to kill you. <laughs> she really said that. And she said, what we really need you to do is take your briefings and make them into a book. And so it took a while to do it. The first thing they did was they recorded my, they took a recording and they typed it down. They said, Steve, you're saying so much stuff here. You have to have footnotes for it. <laughs> so, so, and we don't know how to do it because they, 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 they wanted me to write, do, the, do a presentation, they recorded and turn it into a book and that was my contribution. <laughs> so then they come back and say, and we don't know where you got these sources. Can you do that? Well, that took two years because of course I'm working full time. The long and short of it is, this book came out and it reflects my briefings. And it has been banned by the White House. And all, I'm not trying to, this is a book that is hard in English if you're native speaking English. So I'm not going to be hurt by any feelings that people say I'll pass on it. Um, but I just want to show you that what the book tries to do from the perspective of somebody who's worked this issue in detail is I just want to tell you how I did it. The organizing principle that's a quote from Barack Obama when he basically said the one organizing principle in the Muslim world is Sharia. And so I raised the question, if we all agree that Sharia is the one organizing principle in the Muslim world, how can you criminalize us knowing it? Because if we can't know the organizing principle, we can't know anything. And then I basically talk about what the red pill is. Uh, I talk about uh, what's called the Islamic movement. This is the Muslim Brotherhood, and about the Muslim Brotherhood's deep, deep, deep penetration into Western establishments. Uh, so much so that me and a friend of mine, we created a, a 501, a uh, uh, NGO, which is gonna stand up in about a month. We, are, we can argue that almost every decision that the United States made in the war on terror, the Brotherhood had a controlling, in, had a strong influence in. That's how powerful they are. And here's the thing, you can't get half the people in the United States to even acknowledge that the Brotherhood exists in America. And they're there. They write articles. They say who they are. There's court cases where their, their information is entered into evidence. And then I introduce another group called the OIC. Who here has ever heard of the OIC, the Organization for Islamic Cooperation? I could brief at national security levels in the United States and find that nobody has ever heard of this organization. But this is an organization that represents every Islamic country at the head of state level all 57 member states, where they make treaties that they serve to the United Nations that have the force of law. And our national leaders do not even know this entity exists. So that, for example, um, in 1992, they served the United Nations something called the Cairo Declaration on Human Rights in Islam. Who here has not heard of that? Uh, you not, have not, not heard. Not heard. Not heard. Oh, yes. Okay. Okay, well, 
And please, if somebody, because I, I, I talk fast, people in English in America say, Steve, slow down. Please tell me to slow down. If there's something I said that's not making the jump, we have enough English speaking, German speaking people, I'm willing to step back and have it explained. I don't, I'm not, I'm not here to bull rush anybody. But now think about this. You didn't know the OIC existed, yet in 1992 they served a legal instrument to the United Nations saying, when the Islamic world says human rights, they mean Sharia, and they mean nothing else but Sharia. So, that when you go to the OSCE, and you hear the Islamic entities talking about human rights, and you think they're talking about human rights from the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, they are not. They're talking about something completely different and recognized at the United Nations. So if you, let me give you an example that I'm making up. This is not a real story, okay? So you go agree with an Islamic country that they can go into the Sudan to do peacekeeping and didn't realize that that gave them the mandate to implement Sharia, which would be to kill the non-Muslims. Non this, is, this is where the mother rubber meets the road. And when you go Google this, at a certain point, you'll be shocked that this could be this public and nobody knows about it. And then you have to ask, how is it that at a, at a, at a cultural level, critical information, which is plainly available, is completely concealed in plain sight? In 1999, the same OIC created something called the International Convention on Countering Terrorism. And the first two articles, then they serve to the United Nations. The first two articles, back to back, say, we define terrorism according to Sharia law. <laughs> well, that means that you can't read the rest of the stuff that would read like anybody's condemning sh terrorism. But guess what, sh guess what Islamic law does not consider terrorism? Um, Jihad. Killing Christians and Jews. Jihad. Yeah. Okay. So you will always hear them say, we condemn all forms of terrorism. And every third or fourth time, you'll hear them say, according to Sharia. Yeah. So, but does it matter that we have a diplomatic, we have diplomatic corps that do not know this when they're negotiating? So let me give you a, another one, and I'll bring it home. In 2005, in December 2005, the OIC met at the head of state level, and they came up with something called the 10-year program of action. And the 10-year program of action was to impose Islamic speech codes on the world through the United Nations. Okay? They adopted a term that was put into motion by a, an organization in America called, I'll get back to you, called the International Institute of Islamic Thought. Right there. Okay, to Triple IT, a Muslim Brotherhood group. They are the ones who coined the phrase Islamophobia in the late 1980s, yeah. where they said, here's the thinking. The left is so successful on racism, sexism, homophobia, that if we put Islamophobia right after that, we can get the left to implement half of our program as part of their program with them never understanding. So there's a little sidebar. You can't understand the, the attack pattern of the Islamic and the Brotherhood, the OIC and the Brotherhood, if you don't understand it's grafted on top of a multicultural narrative, which at a certain point they'll just cast aside if they win and if the left wins it to that. So what I'm trying to point out here is, in 2005, they passed a resolution at the head of state level. Every head of state of the Islamic world was good with this, saying that they wanted to convert uh, the speech codes of America to what? to Islamic speech code standards. And guess what? I'm cutting it short here, but Islamic speech law says that you can't say anything about Islam that Islam does not permit you to say. Even if it's correct. Even if it's correct. So, when you go to the OSCE last Friday, Thursday night, and you had the left saying, on record, that you could, you could say something known to be true and that would qualify as hate speech, mm -hmm. you would know that that is completely alien to Western concepts of free speech that mm -hmm. our diplomatic world is all on board with that is completely in line mm -hmm. with, with Islamic speech standards. 
So I, I want to bring that current because this is the 10th year of the 10-year program of action. In the first week of the first month of the 10-year 10 10 year plan, uh, Charlie had one. Then you had Copenhagen. Mm -hmm. Then you had a, a, a third thing, which I can't remember. You had the, the attempted killing on Garland, Texas. Mm -hmm. This is the year they plan to execute that. And you're going to see series of events that are going to get you to be called strange for standing up for free speech rights that your own leaders and media are going to say you are a hater because you're advocating hate. And while we believe in free speech, we don't believe in hate, and that's illegal. And the reason they'll do that is because there'll be acts of terrorism. A uh, question, was Floyd Hood part of their program? For Floyd Hood? Floyd Hood no, said. no. But let me say this. In January 2000, and I don't want to spend too much time because we're going to go to the interfaith part of this. In January 2005, excuse me, in, Je in December 2005, you had the OIC declare, okay? that the 10-year plan. In January of 2006, I was warning uh, Central Command, the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and OSD and other people, you need to watch what's going on over in Europe with this cartoon crisis. This is big. Ah, oh, get out of here. We got a war to fight. So in March, they asked me to come and say, Steve, could you please explain to us how you saw this coming? Because we didn't see it. I said, yes, you did, because I sent you this stuff. Yeah, 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 but we didn't see it. And guess what? They never, ever see it. Mm. I, I, but, but, but why are they so blind? Why are they so blind? Well, let's put that off to questions and answers at the end. Oh, okay, but let me just say, you then had the cartoon crisis later that year. You had Pope Benedict mm -hmm. and his uh, Regensburg oh, okay. speech. Mm -hmm. Then you had the trial of the attempted trial of, um, of um, uh, Gert Wilders. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Then you had... In, uh, uh, then you had the Quran burning minister in Florida. Now what you need to know is they had riots because he said he was going to do it and he decided not to do it, but they still had riots. But more important, and this is important for, this, for your question, and, and we'll put off questions till after the end for this, mm -hmm. just because I think it's important to understand. We're blind to something which is a freight train coming right down the middle of the highway and and in one of my briefings, I basically say, we are living in a time where Obi-Wan could say, these aren't the droids you're looking for, move on. That people will just say, just like we saw at the conference, this is not real, we could just not look at that. And you watch everybody look a different way. But what you had is, um, what's really important about the OIC, the tenure plan program of action is, then after they had the riots with the minister who did burn a Quran, then about three months later, you find in Mazari Sharif, which is a backwater of, of, of Afghanistan, 90% illiteracy, 99% does not speak English, right? Okay, and all of a sudden there are these massive riots because it turned out that a minister then did burn a Quran in Florida. But here's the thing, the only time it hit the news that the minister burned a Quran in Florida in the United States was when they saw the riots there. It was never reported in America, because who cares? But what it means is, that event full of all these English language placards, that event was completely stage managed. Completely stage managed. The only people killed were, guess what? UN, UN employees. Only people killed. But the point of it is, you had these riots in Masri Sharif, they were extremely violent, and they had central command literally go, oh, what's going on here? And the goal was for them to turn around and say, listen, minister, your ex exercising your First Amendment right inside the United States is getting in the way of us fighting our war here. And so did, did, the OIC, did that activity help or hurt for the OIC? It already got our leaders to understand their success in terms of satisfying their narrative against U.S. citizens. Then you had a situation where a, uh, a sergeant in the U.S. Army was asked by an imam in a jail, the Bagram jail, to burn Qurans because they were spreading messages about it. This is not under, nobody argues this. This is not, in, this is, these are stipulated, that's a stipulated fact. Okay, 
So at the direction of the Imam, they go and burn Qurans. And in Islamic law, it says that proper destruction of a Quran is through burning. There are massive riots. Karzai, not the Taliban, okay? Mm -hmm. The OIC, not Al Qaeda, demand that he be punished and be punished severely. And there's riots. And nobody can understand this huge violent upswing. The, the command, the, the central command, MNFI or uh, ISAF, uh, International Security Force Afghanistan, they're, they're totally shocked at this huge uprising. They don't know what to do about it. But the interesting thing is, is Karzai then brought in the Taliban to negotiate with each other about what the proper punishment should be for the soldier. They conceded in their own discussion that they knew he had no intention to do wrong, demanding his punishment. You had the U.S. Army review his activities and say he violated no uniform code of military justice statute. So. The, the, the side demanding punishment understood there was no intention. The side who was being asked to punish understood there was no violation of the law, and he was punished. Now that, that's pretty unprecedented. So the thing is, is as we see this 10-year program of action, they, they planned it this year, so you should expect to see very harsh actions where your action-reaction cycle should be how to respond to your media when they try to adopt that standard to shut you down. And this is where I get to a point where we're gonna go into the briefing because I spent too much time here. But, but it's important to know the 10-year plan. And, and, and that it's really in there, it's really locked in solid. Uh, what did I wanna say? It's really important to know. Well, I'll go on. But what I wanna show you here is, just going through the, in a, in a, it's just the table of contents. After we get to who the OIC is, I talk about what their program of action is. And then chapter part seven, it's a 100 page chapter, it's called Catastrophic Failures. And the first thing I do is I show how there was catastrophic failure by our law enforcement inside the United States not to take action against people known to be dangerous, already identified as terrorists. For example, Anwar al waki okay, was already identified as a Hamas and an Al-Qaeda terrorist when you read their notes and they say, we stopped following him when he went into the Pentagon to brief our generals on multiculturalism. You read the FBI note after the, that very organization identified him as a terrorist. They said, we stopped monitoring him when he went to the US Capitol building to do the Friday prayers. And so you're saying, well, why was he allowed to go into the Pentagon? Mm -hmm. Why was he allowed? Because I was working in the Pentagon at that time, and I say, now I know why these generals were telling me I didn't have the big picture, <laughs> if you know what I mean. But the point of it is, you get to Major Hassan, who shot those people at Fort Hood. They knew he was a bad guy and did not take action. You had the uh, April 15th uh, Boston Marathon bombing. Yeah. Okay. They had the Russians gave U.S. law enforcement clear warning of how dangerous these people were, and now even at this thing in Garland, Texas, they they announced their decision to act. What you have is every major terrorist attack inside the United States since 9/11. There is knowledge that the people whose job it was to protect our public from this let this happen in, in the face of information they knew they had. The second part of that chapter seven catastrophic failures is about how it has affected our ability to fight the war over there, okay? And I maintain the position that we allowed ourselves to be influenced by Islamic narratives from the Brotherhood, the Muslim Brotherhood, and through the OIC that ensured that every decision we made would fail, and fail at a critical point according to someone else's estimation. And of course, section eight goes into the left wing part of you have, to under, you have to understand the left wing attack to understand how they're coming in through it. Because you can't understand what you're seeing at the OSCE unless you see that it's these, it's these uh, statist dipl diplomats who truly do not comprehend. Would you agree? They clearly have no comprehension of what's going on. When, when, when you're at a conference, when you're at a conference where the theme is building bridges, and you don't know that building bridges is a major Muslim Brotherhood 
term that has a specific understood meaning, mm -hmm. and you're talking about building bridges, you don't understand that narrative. If you don't understand the narrative you're talking throughout an entire international session, the European, what is it, East, the OSCE, Organization for Security See? Cooperation yeah. Europe, that the entire narrative is a narrative established by the OIC. It, it, it's bad. It, what, what's worse, that they're, they're following a the narrative they don't know they're following, or that they would be following it and they did know? That, I mean, that's a philosophical question. But what I'd like to do is we'll go through this briefing, and what it has to do with is, is a certain part of it. Someone has to do this for me, because I yeah. can't. It's a, it's a different language. Different language. Escape. I, okay. We just need to bring up, this, bring up the presentations. Um, I said we can't go too far on questions because I went on a detour on the OIC. I think it's important because it'll give you understanding about why you'll see these what appear to be random attacks. And there's a reason they can be random but not random at the same time. So this is my brief. This is why I call it the red pill brief. What's going to happen is maybe, I'll, maybe about nine months from now, I'm going to hire somebody, a good editor, and we're going to take this book. It's got 150 pages of footnotes. We're going to, because this, this is about making sure you understand this is not going to be proven wrong. It's not going to get into a tie with anything. This is what's happening. But what I'll do is I'll take, I'll take this book and we'll shrink it down to a 200-page book without footnotes mm -hmm. that people can read and get the, get the understanding of it. And then if they want to go and back it up, they can go to a heavier book and, and get that. But to me, it's really important that a foundation be laid that if people want to use something for a roadmap, they can look at that, they can you know, do a little statistical fact checking to make it clear that there's nothing here that's even exaggerated. So what we have here is, this, this briefing I was asked to give is a, spe a specific form of, um, of what's going on, and this is called the interfaith delusion is what I call it. Now, I'm gonna jump the gun here, and I brought a couple books here. Well, I'll, I'll just use this book for now. This is called Interfaith Dialogue, a guide for, for Muslims, and it's written by Muhammad Shafiq and Muhammad Abu Nimr. And what's important to understand is they're very closely tied with the Muslim Brotherhood in America. So here you see, this book is put out by the International Institute of Islamic Thought, the Triple IT, which is the Muslim Brotherhood, okay? And so I started reading this, and I started kind of realizing that it says certain things that really surprised me, and I, put a brief together to kind of address this because if you're in America, you're saying, when Pope Benedict came over to the United States in 2008, he was giving speeches that attacked the OIC. But then the American bishops completely undermined him. So that when he went to, a, when he went to some interfaith forum, every person that the American bishops had the Pope meet were all Brotherhood Pope, uh, players. So what's going on here? And you'll find that it's kind of a lot worse right now because it seems like the, the current pope is in that situation. This interfaith thing is about most of the, all, all major denominations. In America, we could basically show that every major denomination has joined into the interfaith movement and that the Brotherhood has chosen the interfaith movement as a point of penetration. Most of the Jews? Yep. Jews also? Uh, some major denominations, yes. We, really? Yes. It, it, it would be true that not every Protestant or Catholic group has bought into this. What you could show is that certain key leadership elements have. Enough that you could show that there's total penetration with any, with it, within any group, if that makes sense. Um, but the thing that this brief will do is it will try to show you that there is... Um, to understand how they could penetrate through the interfaith movement, you kind of have to know what the interfaith movement is. And I'll let, um, I'll let Elizabeth give some detail, but here's somebody that I'm being told is he's an unknown person in, 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 in Austria and in Europe, and there's a reason why, he's an American, okay? But his name is Saul Alinsky. Who here has never heard of Saul Alinsky? Oh, 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 